I am finished. Next slide. I think that goes on to you, Danny. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce Danny Falk, who's our um, facilitator of this website of this webinar and has put a lot, a lot of work into making it, getting it all together and making it as good as it's going to be. Um, Danny is a doctoral student in the International and Comparative Education Program at Teachers College, Columbia University, and her research focuses on how particularly forced displacement influences the professional and personal experiences of teachers, as well as the policies that affect educators in fragile and conflict affected contexts. So she's currently conducting research on teacher and student well-being in Uganda and South Sudan. And she is also a co-author of a landscape review on teacher well-being in low resource crisis and conflict affected contexts. And prior to joining Columbia University for her um, doctoral program, Danny was the lead, lead trainer and capacity building manager for a program called Teachers for Teachers in Kakuma Refugee Camp in Kenya. So Danny, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Ellie, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of the amazing educators and teachers and um, participants who have joined this webinar. I'm really excited to be able to discuss something that's very near and dear um, to my heart and um, I'm looking forward to the presentations from our teachers as well as the discussion that we'll have, as Ellie had mentioned, towards the end of the webinar. So before we get started, I just wanna quickly review um, our agenda for the next two hours or so. Um, I'm gonna begin the webinar with a very brief introduction about the importance of teacher well-being, and then introduce a conceptual framework that my colleagues and I have put together um, in order to better understand what we mean when we're talking about teacher well being, particularly in low resource crisis and conflict affected contexts. And as all of us are well aware and really cannot escape, um, the world is experiencing an unprecedented crisis that is the coronavirus or COVID-19. And um, I think the latest estimates from UNESCO um, have been that 65 million primary and secondary school teachers are directly affected by school closures, by um, the move to distance learning by the crisis more generally, and I'd say that that is probably a conservative estimate. But what we also want to recognize is that this is not the first moment teachers have had to live through or work through a crisis or a conflict or insecurity and instability. And when we think about working as a teacher or working in crisis contexts, it's important to recognize the ways in which the environment in which we're working and the crisis affects our well-being on top of um, the way that our profession affects our well-being. And we know that teaching is one of the most stressful professions. Um, so we have an amazing opportunity today to learn from four teachers who have worked in different crisis settings, and many of whom are, are working now through the COVID-19 crisis as teachers. Um, we have Moisa Seydou, who will share his experience in, um, as a teacher in Sierra Leone, um, a post-conflict country in West Africa that also was affected by the Ebola crisis, um, health crisis several years ago. Mayan Aguerre Arak, who is a South Sudanese refugee teacher working in Kakuma refugee camp, and Shakira A. Pietri Burgos and um, Dr. Carmen Liliana Medina, who are joining us from Puerto Rico, um, where, again, multiple crises within the government and um, environmental crises, and now, of course, with COVID-19, um, have been working amidst um, um, a whole span or range of, of crisis. Um, 
Afterwards, we'll have some breakout room discussions and get you guys talking and, and interacting with one another and with our presenters. And we'll conclude with um, a reflection and questions and answers. But as Ellie had said, we really encourage you guys to ask questions um, in the chat box throughout so that we can start organizing them and seeing the things that um, you guys are finding interesting and would like a little more um, time to discuss. So why do we care about teacher well-being? I mean, I don't think I have to convince you guys. Unfortunately, in some of my other work, I, I have to convince people why it's important to care about teacher well-being. So I've gotten, I, I think, kind of good at it. You can, you can be the judge of that. Give me some constructive criticism um, in the chat box. Um, but we know that teachers play an essential, and I would argue, unparalleled role in, in delivering quality education. Research demonstrates that teachers are the most important school level factor for student learning. And increasingly, there's more and more evidence that indicates the relationship between teachers' own well being and their students' social, emotional, cognitive development and well being. So, their holistic growth as as young learners and, and young people. And teachers recognize this connection as well. So on, on this slide, I've put a quotation from another one of my colleagues in Kakuma refugee camp, um, a Ugandan teacher who said, I came to realize the well being of a teacher is very important in the process of learning because when the teacher is not well, that will affect the learners in the class both the teacher and the learner, they should be well, mentally, emotionally, and physically, because if one of them is affected, then the learning will not take place in the school. I love this quote, because I think she so directly, succinctly, and poignantly captures this important relationship that is often overlooked. Um, and I say this because we also know, and there's a lot of research and evidence that points to this, that teaching is one of the most stressful professions. And I don't think I have to <laughs> explain that to all of you um, as teachers. Our work is so rewarding, but it's also really stressful. Um, and although we know that teaching is really stressful and it's really important, there's also, um, an unfortunate trend of teachers receiving insufficient support to protect and promote their own well being. And this is particularly true amidst crisis. I'm sure you can think of examples now from teaching during COVID of shifting to online learning, maybe with not as much support as you would have liked, or managing new and additional responsibilities um, during this time without, um, like, guidance from um, the school administration. Um, and in crisis contexts where I've worked, um, the stress of teaching is compounded by insecurity, by violence, by like extreme resource deprivation. You'll hear a little bit about that from Aguirre. And the support for teachers is really inadequate or completely absent. And so this presents a really interesting and I would argue very upsetting paradox. So we know teacher well-being is so important and it's recognized as being incredibly important by many different actors um, and it's central and foundational to their work of delivering quality education. Yet we also know that there's a a lack of attention paid to teacher well-being and there are few education policies or programs that address well-being directly. So motivated by this tension or this paradox, trying to unpack it, my colleagues and I endeavored to better understand teacher well-being in the hopes that a clearer conceptualization of the term, which can sometimes be a little elusive, um, would be an important first step 
in providing more and better support to teachers. So we came up with this, what we call in academia, um, this conceptual framework um, or a way to think about visually um, and unpack and unload this term of teacher well-being. So my colleagues, Paul Frizzoli, who's now at the Lego Foundation, and Emily Varney and Julia Finder Johnson, who are at Save the Children, developed this conceptual framework with funding from the Education Equity Research Initiative, um, which is led by Save the Children and another um, organization called FHI 360. And we developed this based on our, a review of the literature on teacher well being, which mostly came from stable contexts for countries in um, uh, uh, middle and high income countries or countries in what we sometimes call the global north. Um, but we also base this conceptual framework on interviews with teachers, mostly in Uganda, Kenya, and South Sudan, as well as our experiences working with teachers in various crisis contexts, um, specifically contexts of forced displacement. So um, a lot of our work has been with refugee teachers or internally displaced teachers. And I'm happy to talk in the Q&A more about the methodology for how we came up with this. And there is a 70 page report that we'll share with you guys um, that unpacks this um, conceptual framework piece by piece um, for those who are interested. But for this presentation, I wanna focus on four main components. And I'd be interested to hear about the ways they resonate with you or not. Um, so as you can see in this visual, um, teacher well-being is not just in the school or classroom setting. Of course, we have um, a school circle. We have these sort of concent concentric circles. Um, but we also are thinking about teacher well-being more holistically, or what we call um, uh, approaching the concept from a socio-ecological framework. So we're thinking about how the community and interactions within the community influence the teacher. We're thinking about the policy context and what it means in terms of, of teacher compensation, um, teacher education, the right to work, um, which is especially relevant in refugee settings, how that influences teacher well-being. So while the classroom and the school setting are of course incredibly important for teacher well-being, we wanted to also recognize that there are important layers outside of the school that have a critical influence on teacher well-being. And across these levels, you can see that in the blue boxes, we've identified several different factors that influence teacher well being. So, for example, in the school level, school resources, school leadership um, are some examples. In the community level, perhaps feelings of responsibility and duty towards the community. And I mentioned some of the national, regional, and global levels, um, which are more policies that influence teachers and their work. And these are factors that emerged um, most frequently when teachers discuss their well being or that emerged from the literature that we reviewed. And what I want to point out about these factors is that they can both positively influence teacher well-being and be a protective factor. You can see the um, protective arrow going up on the left-hand side of the screen, or they can be a risk factor and impede teacher well-being. So all of these factors have the dual component of either helping or hindering teacher well-being, and they interact and intersect in many different ways. So it's it's pretty complex, but at the same time, we hoped by pulling out the factors, it would help um, 
begin to make the concept of teacher well-being a little more clear when we're thinking about the variables that we need to consider when we're supporting teacher well-being. So a third component, as I said, I wanted to mention four important components, is that we wanted to sort of shed the, um, the elusive nature of the term and make it feel a little more clear and tangible. And so we tried to do this by also breaking down well-being into four constructs. And you can see this in the box on the top left-hand corner of the visual. So we, sorry. Um, so we, we were considering teacher well-being as comprising of four constructs um, that included teacher self-efficacy, job stress and burnout, job satisfaction, and social emotional competence. So again, these are um, outcome-based constructs that we hoped could help policymakers and practitioners design programs that aim to improve teacher self-efficacy and their beliefs in themselves and their ability to reduce job stress and burnout, to increase job satisfaction, and to help further develop social emotional competence. Um, and finally, the fourth component before we get to the heart of the webinar today and the amazing teacher presentations is that this work, while um, I think it's relevant for many contexts, is rooted in crisis and conflict affected contexts. And it is grounded within the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies, or INEE's, minimum standards of educational um, practice, policymaking, and research that for those who joined the webinar last week, you learned a little bit about the INEE minimum standards. So this conceptual framework is informed by those minimum standards, and within the report, we operationalize this conceptual framework in a key actions matrix where we provide specific recommendations for how to better support teacher well being in crisis and conflict affected settings that is also linked directly to the INEE minimum standards. So, to get to the heart of the presentation and um, at least what I'm most excited about is um, we're now going to be hearing from amazing educators who have worked amidst various crises, often complex crises or multiple crises that have occurred at the same time and who are also working as teachers now during COVID-19. So, the three presenters, um, and we'll first hear from Moisa, and then we'll move to Aguirre, and then Shakira and Carmen, are all going to respond to the guiding questions that you see on the right side of my screen, or of the screen. So they'll share what additional roles and responsibilities they've taken on as teachers working throughout a crisis. And again, um, while I think COVID-19 will come up, we're also um, taking an opportunity to learn from teachers who have worked amidst crises before COVID-19. So they're going to talk about um, the specific crises that they've, that they've lived through and worked through. Um, and then also how their work influenced their well-being and how their well-being then influenced their work and get to some actionable um, strategies around stress management that Moisa, Aguirre, Shakira, and Carmen um, have used to promote their well-being, um, even working amidst a crisis. So I'm now going to turn it over to Moisa, who is um, a, a friend and a colleague at Teachers College, Columbia University. Um, but before he joined Columbia, and as he reminded me before the webinar, he has always a teacher. Um, but he, he is a teacher and human rights and social change campaigner from Sierra Leone. 
as you can see on the slide, um, we have the map of Sierra Leone up. It's on the western coast of the African continent. And he has more than 17, one seven, 17 years combined experience in the field of education, community building, and global development. Outside of the classroom, Moise has worked on many issues, including um, female genital mutilation, girls' right to education, um, and other wider issues around student sexual and reproductive health. Um, and their rights, so a, a human rights activist. And in 2015, he came back to school to get his first master's, Moisa is now getting his second master's, um, in international development. And after getting that degree, he returned to Sierra Leone and had the opportunity to reconnect with his former teacher colleagues in mostly rural, poor, and marginalized communities in the country. Um, during that time, he also worked with the Open Society Foundation on a specific Ebola litigation project. And in this role, he observed the daily struggles of teachers in crisis at the intersection of education, conflict, and health in Sierra Leone. So I think a lot of relevant learnings for today. Um, and it was this experience and this passion that Moisa had um, that continue to drive his interest in thinking about the role of teachers, specifically in public health crises. So now Moisa is getting his Master of Education at Teachers College, and he is continuing his work and now his research on um, teachers' role and their well-being and their responsibilities um, during health epidemics. And his philosophy about teaching is that a good teacher, I think this is very powerful before I turn it over to Moisa, can shape the minds of students and protect and promote their well being during a crisis. And um, in order to do this, teachers need to be supported and their well being needs to be accounted for. So, Moisa, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Danny, for the wonderful introduction. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone from across the world. It's really important for me to be um, sharing with you my own experience um, from Sierra Leone and um, also to hear and learn from you because I, I believe there's a lot of parallels here in this room. It's not just me telling you, but also learning about your own strategies and things like that. As Danny stated, I, I have been in this work for the past 17 plus years. Um, the most interesting aspect of this of my work as a teacher also was I was involved um, in human rights work. So I was an educator, I was also campaigning. So what you may have seen on the sociological model, I was also operating at the policy level, grassroots, but also in the classroom. So uh, my experience is really more combined and which I'm going to share with you. Um, um, today. There's a lot to share, but in just 15 minutes. So when we go into the breakout room, just feel free, we'll share more. Uh, I come from Sierra Leone. Um, Sierra Leone is um, it's a country that really presents a, a unique case for, for protracted and complex conflict. I say protracted because we had a decade-long civil war from 1991 to um, 2000, about that. And after that, we had the worst cholera outbreak in 2012. And as if that was not enough, we had measles uh, outbreak also, the last of fever in 2013. And we had one of the, we had, one, we had the country that was the hardest hit by the little Ebola outbreak in West Africa. We, we um, it's not a proud thing to say, but we, we had, we could account for the highest number of survivors, but also victims by the Ebola. And now we are also caught in the COVID. But just even before going to the COVID, um, during the Ebola, um, up to 1.7 million um, children were stopped from going to school. 
and we lost up to 78 teachers. That is just the official figures for a country of just 5 million people. And now we are now recording one of the highest incidents of COVID in, in the country. So in all this protracted chain of um, um, crisis, education has been at the center. Teaching, school and schooling has been at the center. Teachers have been um, at the crossroad in all this. And based on my background, I have been involved in all these um, processes and I've seen um, evidence of the intersection of development, conflict, education, and health. So um, coming to the question, um, what are my, my, my responsibilities um, as a teacher um, during, um, during um, the crisis? Um, this is basically the face of Sierra Leone. I mean, on, on the right, that is uh, our toilet. We call that a VIP because that is basically what the school can afford. VIP means very important personality. But the irony of this also is like that, um, that toilet has four rooms. There are teachers using the other rooms, the boys and the girls using the other rooms, something like that. And on the left here, you have an additional school building that was built by the community because of the oversized excessive um, classrooms and, and things like that. And down here on the left, that is some of the strategies sometimes I use to cope with students, workshop things and things like that, just to take them out of the, the formal kind of Sparta learning, just for them to feel relaxed and be in development. So key responsibilities that I really took on during um, crisis is one, I am part of all INGOs um, um, working on the front line. So that means I'm really that on the front line, translating, educating the communities about health precautions, safety, uh, safeguards, and things like that. I'm also teaching at the same time. That is in addition to my normal teaching. And, and number two, I'm, I'm also part of um, making sure that when students are going to go back to school, um, we work with them to sanitize, work on these stigmatization things because some students really when throughout the crisis, when they go back to school, they are different. They may have lost their parents. Um, they are coming back as orphans. Some of them are coming back with more serious mental psychosocial challenges. And some of them are really coming back better and things like that. So my job is basically also as a counselor. And then the last thing which is also significant is that I am also someone who is supporting some of these students. Um, because sometimes when I'm among my colleague um, teachers, my position is complicated by the fact that um, I don't actually rely on the government salary because I'm also working for NGOs and teaching. So that means I'm sometimes in the position to share the little that I have with some of these students that are really vulnerable. We come from a low resource country. When we say low resources, deprived, marginalized communities. Because I know low resources is a relative term. When we say low resource in the United States is different from low resource in, in, in Sierra Leone. So when I really mean by low resources, marginalized, poor, excluded communities. So those two schools you see there, United Muslim Association Secondary School that I teach and government model, these are really low resource schools. And these are these are schools that are manned by teachers that, we, uh, that are, we call them UU most times. They are unqualified and mostly untrained. That is UU. Um, so most people really go into the teaching field um, so that they can just survive, but they get on love in the job and get more passion. Yeah, so I, in terms of my thoughts, significant responsibilities that I talk about, I, I share some of um, the things that I have with them. I open my doors. Uh, for example, in Syria, the irony was during the Ebola crisis, when everyone was asked to be quarantined, this is the time, paradoxically, that we had the highest incidence of teenage pregnancy. Can you imagine the time when the government asked everyone to stay indoors, no schooling? This is the time we had the highest incidence of teenage pregnancy. How did that happen? So, you know, some of the students came back really battered. And now the government introduced a policy, say, no school for pregnant girls. So my other responsibility as a campaigner was to promote inclusion, diversity. 
that education is their right on no account that they should be stopped from coming to school. So I was also in that environment to make sure policies are inclusive. It is not their fault that they got pregnant, but they have a right as others. But sometimes there are a lot of other well-being issues. Bringing this student back in the classroom, they're pregnant, they have specialized needs. How are you going to support them? What I normally do is just to share my meager salaries because I always have other ways to survive, support them and link them to NGOs that are really working on, on, on support um, things for, 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 for some of these students. Um, so in, in summary, this were really um, some of the things I do in, 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 some, in terms of teaching, taking up responsibility and during crises, um, connecting with communities, calling students um, during the, the lockdown. Lockdown means like quarantine. I use my mobile phone and call them up. I mean, just share lessons with them because normally to make up for, for learning during the crisis, the government use the radio as an official remote learning strategy, but some families cannot even afford that. And even if they have one radio, they're not really understanding because the teachers who are really transmitting messages are not really trained. They have never used gadgets like this. So some of us really who get this training can just take our mobile phones, so put it on speaker and we'll go through lessons, check on them. And we are using our own phones to do this because the, the, the government did not ask us to bring this addendum. They want us to use official remote learning strategies, but we want to deepen the engagement with students. It goes more than just teaching them. Oh, that you are losing your math assignment. Let's talk about math. It goes, it includes more, I mean, including more coping strategies and things like that, emotional helpful things. So I do that. So in terms of how uh, my well-being um, is affected or how my how, how my webbing affects my teaching or how my teaching affects my webbing in the context of crisis, there are a lot. Because conflict, um, uh, largely, is not to respect our person. We are all affected by, by conflict. Just the fact that, I um, mean, you, you wake up in the morning, you don't have to go to school anymore because everything is closed. It, it's, it's really traumatic. It's, it's really frustrating. And just the fact that, I mean, some students that are great in your school, you, you hear that, they've been affected by COVID or by Ebola, it's really frustrating. And you know, it, you know, it just turns your whole um, life around because you are connected to these students by, by every means. For me, teaching has been really a matter of life, not just really a choice because this is a profession that has been passed down from generation to generation in my family. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really more always connected to students. So, I mean, sometimes I, I feel more um, frustrated about the gender issues that happen during um, crisis context when they see all oh, the women teachers, for example, you don't have to come to the front now, you can stay home. You know, as a human rights activist, I have issues with that. All the girls, you don't have to be part of this workshop, let the boys come. All these cultural issues affecting education that is supposed to be you know, a site for reconstruction, but still they are, I mean, they are just dividing communities. That's really frustrating for me. And um, this will apply to me and also bring in the unique experience of teachers from the classroom. In the context of conflict, this is the time also that teachers go like for five, six, seven months without salaries, without salaries. And the government expect them to understand. So teachers in my countries, in my country are known for protesting, are known for all is taking on the street because they are demanding their salaries. Because this is the only thing that they have got to call their own to move. They have families too. So you feel for the other teachers. I always say my position as a human rights activist and some of who is working is complicated by the fact that at least I can get something outside of teaching. But my colleagues, most of them, all of them, sometimes they don't get some of these things. So it's a well-being issue for me because it affects how, you know, I think about the profession and my own role, you know, how can I make things better? And also, I mean, sharing something that you have that is not enough, it, it, it also affects me a lot. And some of these students who also come back to the classroom, very more troublesome, because my job basically is to reinforce some of these things that are taught at home. But if 
I mean, the parents are not really up to the responsibility because they are all sitting at home. They are now sending these kids also out in the risky environment to sell and make money for the family because now there is no school. It's so risky. That's also for me a, a, a well-being issue. Um, a lot of some of these things really, really affect me. And some of these um, gender things, how women are also excluded, women teachers are excluded in terms of empowerment really, really affect my well-being. And some of these teachers are also very angry. Uh, I was many years ago until I became a human rights activist using the cane and because they bring their frustration to the class, there is crisis, there is no salary, you know, you just use the cane. They, they don't try to adopt some of these empowering strategies. Why are students behaving like this? How can we connect to the home to understand that there are synergies, you know? Um, Danny, before I go to the last point, how many minutes have I got left? Um, you have just about three minutes left. That's right. So some of the um, coping strategies that I've adopted over the years in the context of crisis, like I said, my country is a conflict-affected context. It's not post-conflict. It's been through conflict. It's still conflict. The, the, the COVID conflict has made public health education exceedingly important. Some of these really coping strategies, one I already um, uh, um, um, said is connecting to this um, student and really share with them how you are feeling. Um, like one of two, two Thursdays ago, I, I was on Zoom with some of my students and I told them um, that I'm really frustrated, I'm, I'm disappointed by the government because teachers are still being paid for four months and it's an obligation of the government. So um, how I try to cope with some of these frustration is I share with them openly and, and they will say, oh, um, but more is that the teachers are volunteers. They are our parents too. They are our teachers. I mean, I mean, they can help us. They can't wait for the government. So, I mean, that keeps me in a kind of a balance, but they don't understand what rights and responsibilities in terms of or obligations for government is. So I try to share that. So by just sitting with them, talking with them, it really gives me some sense of hope. And the other thing that is more empowering for me in terms of coping strategy is I see these students as future leaders. I see them as lawyers, as teachers, as doctors, as engineers. So when I see these students, even when I'm frustrated, I see community, I see the future. I see that my role is really building the world in that classroom, but also out of the classroom. And that helps me a lot to revisit my own inner conviction and, and things like that. And the other thing also, apart from the emotional, is I did a lot of exercise. I mean, being a teacher's college, I've learned a lot of meditation and other exercises, um, thanks to Danny and others in some of these classes. So I meditate a lot, and now I, go, I try to go into newspapers and go to the literary world just connect myself to other things outside of the classroom. That helps me a lot to, to, to manage. And, and lastly, connecting with other teachers across the globe and draw parallel is also important. When you hear from them, their own experience, you will just say, thank God, I think I'm better off than them. That's really important for you to confront your own confusion. When you hear from other people's story, LinkedIn, Facebook, all over this place, it's really important. And lastly, I rely on hope. I believe that education is the most powerful tool that can change the world. And if I've decided to serve in that capacity, um, it's not that well-being issues are not going to pop up, it's how you respond. But in the interest of all, there should be a collective movement for authorities to really focus on um, complying and promoting their own obligations. Um, so I'll see you on the other side. There's a lot to say, but just in 15 minutes. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Moisa. That was really um, interesting here. Just a few more pictures, some copied over that Moisa had shared of um, schools where he's worked. And I think um, in some ways there are overlaps to our next teacher presenter who, who um, could not join us in real time, but we have some recordings and images um, that um, he shared and I have taken in my work um, in Kokuma refugee camp. So we're next going to hear from Aguer, who is a South Sudanese refugee teacher in Kokuma refugee camp. Um, the image on the slide is um, of a school compound. 
um, and the map in the corner of the um, screen uh, where the red dot is, is where Kakuma is located in the northwest of the country. Um, so Aguirre has been teaching for about four or five years. Um, he grew up as a refugee in Kakuma fleeing violence in what was then Sudan, what is now South Sudan. Um, so he attended school in the camp and he is now a teacher in in the camp and I'm going to turn it over to Aguirre. He's um, a, a math teacher and a class teacher for what would be um, seventh and eighth grade in the U.S. or what he calls um, and in the Kenyan system is primary seven or primary eight. So the two um, grades before secondary school. Hi, my name is Aguer, a teacher at Kadugli Primary School in Kakuma refugee camp. I want to talk about my additional roles as a teacher in this uh, kind of environment. I want to talk as well about how my work has influenced my well-being and how my well-being has also influenced my work. And finally, I would love to touch on how I manage my stress. Now here, I'm going to talk about uh, my additional roles as a teacher. And in this context, we are experiencing increased responsibilities of teachers. And to mention a few, my first additional role as a teacher in this context is to support vulnerable learners and learners with protection issues. Here, it is my role as the teacher to identify the signs of distress in learners in which after identification we find out that most learners are having learning difficulties like those who have no basic education background some are traumatized due to the scenes of wars and deaths they have witnessed drug and substance abuse due to lack of parental guidance and peer influence orphans child-headed families or households teenage mothers early pregnancies child marriages and some of the learners have special cases like those who are visually impaired, physically challenged, hearing impairment, among others. After identification, I have to react positively and appropriately because this, their well-being is mine too. Providing guidance and counseling to those who are traumatized, drug and substance abusers, teenage mothers, child-headed households, among others, will always make learners feel included in learning and this motivates them to keep attending school. Talking to parents and other caregivers to encourage learners to attend school regularly and to make them understand the importance of education for them. I also talk to the school administration and the department in charge of the school meals to provide additional food support to the learners of the, of the child-headed families, orphans, teenage mothers, to give them more time for studies than looking for food. And also parents, and also prevents them from child labor. In my school, I'm also the child protection for call teacher, and therefore it is, my, it, it is very easy for me to record the cases and report them to the organization in charge. That is the, the Lutheran World Federation, LWF. And in my context, there are no special schools for the visually hearing, physically impaired learners, apart from the JSU Refugee Services, that is the GRS, who supports the mental challenge learners. And therefore, it is my role to cater for their needs by reporting the cases to the organization that employs teachers to employ the SNE teachers or the special need education teachers or offer training on such areas to the teachers. After all, I have to follow up with the persons in charge to motivate the learners to study effectively. Now, my second additional role is offering support to teachers in Kakuma and Kalobaye. Uh, Kalbae is a neighboring settlement camp next to Kakuma. 
I got lucky and I received a teachers for teachers training through Columbia University and after a couple of months I was recruited in the team to help implement the project in the in the two camps and therefore I offer training to the teachers and also some senior education officers. I also go around the school to support teachers in planning for their lessons and also how to come up with solutions to the challenges they face. And one of the ways that I do this is through the teacher learning circles, the TLCs, where teachers come together in groups to discuss their challenges and come up with the solutions. How to identify signs of distress in learners and how to act. Reporting mechanism for protection cases, positive discipline, their well-being, and many more. Currently, and also my third additional role, is offering distant learning to the students around Kakuma refugee camp. This is because of the fear for the coronavirus. And to begin with, I started home-based teaching because most learners were calling me to assist them over the pandemic end. And so with the observation of the coronavirus regulations, I had to offer some support to those who need help, especially grade eight and seven. The organization in charge of the schools have started a radio program where lessons are offered through the radio. My role here is to look for learners and a radio for the learners to access learning and I give an additional support to since the person talking in the radio station cannot be asked for inquiries or questions. Countrywide, learners are learning on social media, but due to lack of scarcity or scarcity of resources in this region, such programs cannot be acquired. Therefore, I have set up a Wi-Fi for easy access of learners to the learning materials. They can access live television shows or create WhatsApp groups for learning as well as Googling. Above all, I also, ha I also have to follow up with them and follow the parents or the caregivers to see if learning is actually taking place. Um, and before I go to um, his next slide, I guess, for those who um, are not familiar with the Kenyan context, their school year is from January to about October. Um, and the government just announced that they will not be opening schools again until 2021. So Aguirre will be continuing to do distance teaching within the camp for the rest of this academic year. Now, here I'm going to talk about how my work has influenced my well-being. My work has influenced my well-being stressfully. This is due to so many reasons, and one of them is overcrowded classrooms. In my context, the ratio of teacher to learners in any given class is 1 is to 70. This means that in my class, I have 181 learners, and this is less compared to other classrooms. Sometimes. Attending to the needs of all these learners is stressful since I cannot move easily to various parts of the class. Lack of motivation is another stressful influence despite the kind of work teachers do under this harsh condition. We do not feel appreciated for the work we do. This means that most employers put more attention on what you have done wrong than what you do right. Too much workload is also another issue. In my case, I handle four subjects in grades eight and seven, some of which are taught seven and five times respectively in a week. And in addition to it, I am a protection focal person and at the same time a senior teacher. And being a senior teacher in, in this context come with a lot of responsibilities too, such as collecting daily attendance, this is because of the school meals, keeping school books and issuing them to teachers on a daily basis, 
admitting new learners, writing weekly and monthly reports. And in this context too, we do not have enough materials for learning and therefore it is up to you as the teacher to make sure your lesson is understood by your students. This means that I have to gather my resources in advance before my lesson. Also, handling conflicts within learners is also stressful. They come from different backgrounds and so they have many differences and this causes stress. In addition, inadequate compensation is also another factor. The kind of work we do in this kind of environment is not equivalent with the compensation we receive. This causes stress at work and it has resulted to many teachers quitting jobs in large numbers. The other stressful thing in my work is that that is affecting my well-being is lack of training for teachers. Most teachers are not qualified or underqualified in this region but they are not being trained as well. Some people like myself are professionals in teaching but because there are no opportunities for furthering it and it is the most essential sector for transforming the world into a better place. The change of curriculum in this country has also made teaching so difficult because I have not been trained on this upcoming curriculum and it is also stressful. Yeah, and I'm sorry, um, we, we got a message in the chat box. All of these pictures are, I should have said, they're pre-COVID. This is from, um, the pictures were taken between 2016 and 2018 um, in the camp. But as you can see, social distancing is not really possible um, in the very overcrowded schools in the camp where at the primary school level, which is sort of elementary school, the average teacher to student ratio is about one to 180. Here, I'm going to talk about how my well-being has influenced my work. And to mention it, my well-being too has affected my work negatively. As I speak right now, my life is being threatened and this has been going on since February 12th uh, this year, where the boys of my community, I uh, fought some boys from another community and one guy happened to lose his life in, in the incident. The boys from my community who did the, the, the act ran back to their home country, leaving us unnotified from there. The other community wants to revenge because they did not find the boy, so they, look, they are now looking for the nearby person where they, they want to revenge on me and some of my colleagues. We have re reported the matter to the police and traced the boys, and some of them were arrested, but still there is no change. I then reported the matter to the UNHCR protection, and again they referred me to the police where I never got any help. I cannot as well go back to my home country since there are so many clashes between the ethnic group, the government fighting even their own citizens by killing people at night in their houses. The only solution for me now is to remain here and stay indoor to protect myself. This has so far affected me emotionally, socially and also cognitively and do not allow me to move. Therefore, can't allow me to go to, to work. Sometimes my own sickness or whenever I'm sick affect, affects me emotionally and mentally, not even allow me to carry out my responsibilities well. In addition, the increased responsibilities like home-based teaching, following up with learners in, even in their homes, setting up a network due to the fear of the coronavirus has also influenced my work negatively. And just, I guess, a quick update. Um, Aguirre is, is now safe and the UNHCR protection has taken care of the conflict. Um, but I think this is a good example of how there are multiple conflicts and um, 
violent conflicts, health conflicts that can compound and amplify the stress that teachers are experiencing in their work as they're still trying to, um, and as all of you guys have been trying to provide quality education to your learners and support their well-being. Um, so this is the last um, slide of Aguirre where he'll talk about his um, stress management strategies. Finally, I want to talk about how my, I manage my stress after a stressful day. Uh, we have seen it um, from the beginning. Uh, our work in this kind of environment is so stressful. And therefore, as a teacher, you don't need to remain you don't need to remain stressed. So there are so many ways I manage my stress. And some, some of these ways that I, I try to relax my mind after a stressful day are, some of the ways are like talking to friends about the issues I have in the hand, thinking about something that makes me happy. And this makes me actually forget about the bad day or the stressful thoughts of that specific day. Also having a professional talk with professionals is also have, helping me relaxing my mind. Sometimes I have to get a hobby, like my best hobby is playing football and this one also relaxes my mind too. Sometimes uh, I count from one to ten as a way of doing some relaxation to my mind and also to myself. Also take deep breath, drinking water, walk away from the situation. These are some of the ways that I have to relax my mind after a stressful day. I as well try to put the problem into perspective and also Sometimes I find time to log in into the social media like Facebook and other pages for fun and, and jokes. And this totally frees me from stress. Um, so unfortunately, Aguirre couldn't join us um, in real time because of different technological issues. But any questions that come up for him, I'm happy to pass them along to, to him. But let's get into our next um, amazing educator um, presenters. So we have Carmen Liliana Medina, who's a, an associate professor of literacy, culture, and language in the education program at Indiana University. Um, in collaboration with colleagues from the University of Puerto Rico, she co-facilitates an initiative called the Critical Literacy Project in Puerto Rico. And um, this initiative was established in 2008 and works with pre-service teachers, um, some of whom you'll hear their perspectives today um, in developing critical inquiry models that explore local and global social issues that emerge from the teacher's experiences. And joining um, Carmen is Shakira Pietri Burgos. And Shakira always knew she wanted to be a teacher um, since she was a little girl. And because of her love of teaching, she enrolled in the University of Puerto Rico um, and graduated in 2019 with a bachelor's degree in elementary education. During her studies, she participated in educational activities in conjunction with a number of different education centers. And she saw that kids do not always enjoy being in school. So in 2019, she started her own virtual school. And today that virtual school enables students to receive a fun, engaging education no matter where they live. Um, so I will turn it over to Carmen and Shakira. Hi, thank you so much. Um, first, I just want to say that I am very honored and humbled to be uh, following both of the stories that we have heard um, and to have an opportunity to situate um, our story of Puerto Rico within the context of the global um, and the local con context of Puerto Rico. So um, Shakir and I are going to present on um, 
the key questions that were given to us, our experiences are a little bit uh, different in the term, in sense that we work more in the context of in between preparing teachers and then supporting teachers in their first year. So you're gonna hear a little bit of how we move between the issues related to teacher preparation, but also teachers in classroom, which they overlap. So first I would like to send, to take this opportunity to thank the webinar organizers, especially Danny and Ellie who worked super, super hard to have this, um, this webinar to put it together and for inviting us. Um, I think it is incredibly important and relevant to hear about our experiences across nations and through teachers' voices. So I'm going to talk a little bit because I was a teacher and like Moises is always, Moises say always a teacher, but I also would like to honor the space of Shakira who is uh, currently a teacher in classrooms. Uh, I want to thank um, Shakira for taking the risk of presenting with me today and also very special thanks to um, my co-organizer and co-researcher and uh, researcher at the University of Puerto Rico, Maria del Rocio Costa, who is 50% um, of this project too, so she's not here with us today, but I want to acknowledge her work at the local level. Um, may I have the next slide, please? So first, just to give you a little bit of context, um, we would like to begin by providing a, a little bit of geographical um, information about where Puerto, Rican, Puerto Rico is located. For those of you that do not know, Puerto Rico is this island uh, that is part of the Caribbean. And for the last 122 years, we have been a colonial possession of the United States. And um, our local educational system is mostly designed around federal laws and mandates such as no, La no Child Left Behind and Como Accords mixed with other local initiatives, which creates a lot of, a lot of tensions between uh, local and federal mandates and who we are as a, as a culturally situated place and the things that get imported and imposed into us. If you look at the population uh, part of the um, of this uh, image, you're gonna look that currently, uh, uh, currently in, and in many ways, as the result of the last year crisis, the amount of Puerto Ricans living in the U.S. is larger than the population in the island. So, and that is usually perceived as a sign of a. Uh, uh, countries living in major crisis when you have such massive migration which create a uh, huge issues within the island um, in relation to uh, to uh, population development and well-being and families living in broken families and so forth um, may I have the next slide please so uh, since 2017, Puerto Rico has been living, dealing with, this, with a series of crises that in many ways have overlapped and we haven't been able to re fully recover uh, for, uh, for uh, all of them. And I just wanna quickly uh, go over those and the consequence, the, the, say a little bit about the consequences of what those have been. Uh, in 2017, we had two hurricanes that hit um, Puerto Rico pretty hard, Maria and Irma. And what, you know, the consequences of that is that it left so many people without homes. We, the island was 100% without power for, a, uh, for almost a month. And basic resources were a, also uh, not available for, for long uh, periods of time the same i mean i i know this personally from one of my sister sisters for example who lives in the country she spent a year without power so it took a year for her to get power uh, back the other another consequence had to do with school closures so schools uh, had to be closed for months many of the uh, schools were used as shelters after the hurricane. Some of them were in no condition to be open. And without power and water, it was just in, uh, in many ways very challenging to open schools because of health issues. 
As a result of Hurricane Maria and Irma, the government decided to do a mass, massive permanent school closure. So in this number, I haven't been able to get the most accurate one because it's cha it sh changes a lot. But um, the government in a privatization effort closed 250 plus schools uh, during, uh, during the time of recovery. So that created another huge disruption within the island. Uh, as I mentioned, another huge uh, consequence was the massive migration from uh, Puerto Rico to the U.S., leaving um, you know parts of the family in the island, parts of the family going to the United States. And if you were following the news, you probably remember you know uh, Orlando becoming one of the centers of uh, the new establishment of Puerto Rican communities uh, during this time. To layer that, we have to deal with the number of corruption accusations that still unresolved and going on from the top do Department of Education officials, such as the Secretary of Education. So layering, layering the crisis that an envir environmental uh, disaster brings, there you, we are going through a humanitarian and a governmental corruption a crisis that it's a that has consequences for all of us. In July 2019, we had we went through the governor's words resignation, uh, very much associated to corruption and also to corrupted and unethical behavior. We have in uh, July 2019, around this week last year, major national protests and demonstrations that forced the governor to resign. But then the persons who replaced the governor is a person from the same political party, so we're still dealing with that same cycle of uh, corrupted and unethical behaviors. In January 2020, Puerto Rico gets hit with an earthquake, and the largest impact of the earthquake was in the southern region, uh, left many families without home. So if you um, look at Puerto Rico now, we have families that still haven't recovered and gotten their homes rebuilt from Hurricane Maria. Here we have an earthquake that layers that uh, crisis and um, adding that many school many schools structures were highly damaged and there was a lot of uncovering about the poor structures in which schools have been built. Uh, so um, there were at this point um, Every all schools were closed for a month, for a month, and over 68 schools never opened, which overlap with the closings of schools of COVID, which is the present crisis. Where all schools, so schools were closed in January, they opened in March. Some never closed, some some never opened, and then uh, all schools uh, closed in March, and we are under quarantine and. Similar to other places, once the quarantine will start uh, to be more flexible, now we have a major increase in cases and we are one of the uh, states, quote unquote, uh, that has one of the highest uh, pickup on COVID in the last week. Uh, one of the biggest problems is the throughout all of this is the local local and federal government lack of plan in supporting uh, all of this crisis. Um, one of the things that happened uh, recently and that's been investigated by the FBI is the local governor corruption scandal with the COVID test purchases. May I have the next slide, please? So what does it mean to, to live in this overlapping set of crisis when people in so many ways perceive Puerto Rico to be a, a, what's a, a established or a kind of like a, a well-developed country is that uh, a lot of a lot of what people perceive as a, a as a as a benefit from being part of the United States in many ways have fallen apart it's a lot of a lot of issues have come out that have really resituated us as a, as a as a country in crisis that has always been in crisis but we have never been paying attention to um, the consequences, and I'm going to do this very um, quickly, is the disruption that uh, how, again, you know, how we are disrupted 
how we can uh, disrupt a deficient and passive role of people in the global south. So we're going to, uh, what, what you start seeing in Puerto Rico is that most of the initiatives come from grassroots and community-based uh, initiatives. We cannot rely on neither of the government mechanisms to help Puerto Rico. So this is, that being very much about us standing up, us developing initiatives that us um, doing. Uh, there's also a major sense of the confianza, distrust, distrust of the local and federal government and abilities to help the island. Uh, another of the consequences is how the local DOE has not been able to develop an efficient recovery plan for any of these crises, so it just keeps accumulating. Um, presently, access to technology for an economically disadvantaged students is a major issue. Um, there are still families without home since the hurricane. <clears throat> and uh, finally, as I said and reiterate, is one of the consequences is that we're seeing more activism and agency coming from communities, organizations, and individual support, and teachers being included in that. So, um, can we have slide five, please? So just to give you a sense of how we're thinking this collectively, we're also we're also at the individual teacher level. Um, what uh, thinking of how communities, organizations, universities, and other in local institutions are helping outside of the government. Um, the project that we have created in with this in this case is the Literacidad Critica in Puerto Rico. And what we have thought is uh, that uh, in supporting pre-service and in-service teachers, we need to create communities where people can communicate. So we have worked together to create spaces where teachers can support, can express themselves in relation to trauma and healing, but also to, to find ways to resist and to find support in, in terms of classroom curriculum, in terms of emotional support, and so, and so forth. So what we, one of the biggest issues that we have seen is that Puerto Rico is being perceived as a part of the United States, but culturally we are not. We are an island in the Caribbean. We are highly associated with so many Latin American uh, traditions, but we in many ways, in many ways, have been denied the opportunity to see ourselves resituated as people from the global south. So the, the project that we have developed in addition to living, in addition to provide a space for teachers to communicate, to heal, to talk, we have developed a literacy, our areas of, of work is in literacy. So in this project, what we have done is to look, use children's literature from Latin America and local authors and the Caribbean to look at social justice and how other people who live in crisis in the South have overcome those crises. So it's very similar to what we're trying to do today in this conversation. So uh, what we're trying to is to it's resituate instead of thinking of ourselves as we are the United States and we come from an Anglo country is to say, how do we reconnect with the global South? How do we uh, can find ways to survive and to heal through the stories of children in the South? So that's um, have been one initiative. So, um, so I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to pass to Shakira who's going to share about her experiences from a teacher's perspective. So hi everyone, my name is Shakira and like Carmen was saying, um, thanks to this project we met and here at, we are at this webinar. So projects like this gives us teachers the support necessary when dealing with crisis situation and that's because um, thanks to them, we can unite, as we have seen here today, and have an opportunity to, to meditate about our perspective and change that perspective. And that's very essential since in crisis situations, we are not, we are more than just teachers. And that's what I'm going to talk about now, about those additional roles and responsibilities that we have taken. So there's a quote that states, I call my students my kids because in our time together, they are not just names on a class list, they become a part of my heart. So can we all relate to that? Of course, I know that everyone in this webinar has felt the same way. And the reason is that we teachers aren't only educators, 
We are mothers, we are friends, we are superheroes, we are mediators, we are counselors, and we are more. However, in times of crisis, those roles are intensified. So we have to be like psychologists, nurses, and even a meteorologist and a pacifier in the case of Puerto Rico with all of this crisis. And, but however, during those times, it is important to keep teaching about what is happening in our world and in our community and be a safe haven to all our students so they feel safe. Can you please go to the next one? Thank you. So we teachers, I said previously that we are like superheroes, but also we have to accept the fact that we're just like any other human being. So it's normal that our well-being will be affected. I remember back on Maria, I had some difficulties, but I wasn't teaching. Nonetheless, now during this quarantine month, it has been a different story. For example, I was supposed to get married, I was supposed to have another things to do, and I had a lot of plans for this past month. But I saw how everything was getting canceled. And as a result, well, I felt sorry, I had a little depression, and I was distracted. I was teaching during this time, and likewise, my students were going to different circumstances, like um, knowing new, new, new ways to learning. But I did my job. But I accept that sometimes it felt like my job. And when you see teaching like a job, it is not the same thing. You stop teaching with your heart. You stop trying and, give, and start giving boring classes, which affects your students. Richard Char Rar, sorry, said, pain that is not transformed will always be transmitted. So when we teachers go through some type of pain, if we don't do something about it, it will reflect in our teaching and it will harm our students. However, after some weeks, I transformed my pain. I got concentrated on my students because they deserve it. So at the end, we end good. Mm -hmm. Can you please go to the next step? slide, sorry. So some things that have, have helped other teachers and I um, will be like to meditate at least five minutes each day, be organized, um, also do some type of physical exercise. Schedule is very, very essential to schedule a time for ourselves to relax. Just do something that you love. It, it might be like two minutes, three minutes, but please do it. That way you can change your perspective. For example, I want you to do with you guys today uh, an experiment. For example, if you see here, right now, you see a white paper, but with a blue dot. In what will you focus? On the blue dot or in the white paper? Well, maybe you will focus on the blue dot. Well, likewise, it's with life. We humans focus on the negative things, but why we teachers don't start, to, don't start and focus on positive things, on all of those white things. I think that is um, super essential to achieve the skill and then to transmit it to our students. Because remember, we are safe heavens and we have to support our children.